Earth and the Mystery of Karma. To the best of our ability, we have tried, in a few short hours, to look at the human journey through the suprasensory world, the realm where human beings live between death and a new birth. Although we are usually unaware of it, our human forces also reach into that world while we are here on the physical earth, in our physical and etheric bodies. In the physical world we sense our suprasensory existence more or less as mystery, one that, unless we find at least a partial answer to it, leaves us inwardly without harmony, stability and security. Indeed, our very life would lack energy and vitality, and true human love would remain beyond reach. Just by observing the human being here, we can see an aspect of our suprasensory human nature, and this can help us understand why the divine spiritual realms sent us into this world of physical senses. In fact, the reason is that knowledge of the suprasensory world must first be spoken of to people here in the physical world. We would have to approach questions of the suprasensory world very differently if we were to speak of them to those who have died and who are passing through their existence between death and a new birth. So today, as we consider human life on earth, it will be appropriate to conclude our study by allowing our minds to light up with what we have received so far concerning the mysteries of the suprasensory world. Let us begin by considering human life on earth. In other words, let us consider ourselves. First, we have our senses. They provide us with information about all that surrounds us. Our senses are the cause of our earthly joy and happiness, as well as our suffering and pain. As human beings, we sometimes fail to consider how significant our sense impressions and experiences are for our lives. And studies such as we have been devoting ourselves to for the past several days take us beyond our life of the senses into spiritual realms. It might seem as though this anthroposophic spiritual science could lead us to underrate sensory life, even to the point of saying that it has little importance and that we should escape it in our own earthly life. Such an attitude, however, is not the result of a spiritual scientific study. Such feelings can never be the ultimate goal of spiritual science. It simply tells us that there are certain ways of living life in the senses that are incompatible with human worth and dignity, and that it is possible to give up the life of the senses in its inferior aspects and regain its deeper significance on a higher spiritual level. We would have good reason to avoid spiritual study if it took away the meaning of all the beauty that, lo- that flows into our souls when we observe the wonderful world of flowering plants and fruiting trees or any other aspect of the natural realm, such as the starry heavens and so on. And if, as a result, we were advised to abandon all this in favor of spiritual contemplation. But this is not at all how it is. When you recall what the initiates and masters of various ages offered for the perfection and dignity of human life, you find that they never diminished the beauty, splendor, and majesty of our earthly life of the senses. Their poetry and other arts were marvelous when describing suprasensory reality. We have only to recall such images as the lotus flower to see that initiates never shied from depicting the spiritual development through images grounded in sensory experience, and that it was their belief that what we find, or at least can find, in the world of the senses leads to the highest. But we human beings cannot find satisfaction in the sensory world as perceived by ordinary consciousness 
because although the impressions that enter us through our eyes and ears and other senses is connected with our capital I being and its whole life and development, it does not really give our I anything to support inner certainty. We gaze outward to the beauty and splendor of flowers and face a world of infinite variety. When we turn our gaze inward toward the eye, at first our ordinary consciousness feels as though the eye has vanished. It seems like it is merely a point of spirit within us that says little more than the empty word I. This is also not surprising. Just consider that before the EYEI can see, it must forget itself completely. It is the nature of our senses that they must surrender to the world so that they can mediate properly between the world and the human being. The EYEI has to be completely transparent to convey the glory, grandeur and beauty of the outer world in all its brilliant color and radiance. And the same is true of the other senses. Really, we know nothing of our senses. Is there any way we can know and understand their true nature? To do this we must again follow the path to the supra-sensory world. Even knowledge of the senses is gained only by traversing the supra-sensory world. You are familiar with my descriptions of the paths that lead into the higher worlds. Footnote C, for example, title A Way of Self-Knowledge and title How to Know Higher Worlds. End of footnote. Try to picture vividly what imaginative knowledge can be. You withdraw from physical perception of the outer world and enter imaginative cognition. But the most interesting thing that happens on this path is something I will describe for you through an image. When you approach the world of imagination in meditation, using methods presented in some familiar book on the subject, you begin to struggle to free the etheric body from your physical organism so that this etheric body, our first supra-sensory aspect, becomes conscious to some degree. You can detect the point in time when you are between ordinary sensory perception and imaginative perception, when you have not yet attained imagination in a developed sense, but are on the way to it. Now, let us picture a person who is on the way from ordinary sensory perception to imagination and is traveling into high mountains where granite is especially abundant, granite with a high content of quartz or silica. As we work toward imagination, our soul forces can develop especially well amid an abundance of silicious rock that is rich in quartz. We succeed in developing certain inner soul capacities on the first attempt because high mountain quartz rock makes a special impression on us. This quartz is initially only slightly transparent, but as soon as we have struggled through to the stage I have described, this mineral becomes completely transparent. We climb into the high mountains and the silicious rock appears as transparent as glass, but in such a way that one has the feeling that something flows from one's own being to unite with the silicious rock. Right there, at the earth's outermost surface, through a kind of natural offering of our consciousness, we unite with the earth's whole surface. At this moment, it seems as though our very eyes are sending out streams that penetrate the quartz. At the same moment something comes to life in us that causes us to feel united with the whole earth existence. In this unity with the quartz, feeling one with the whole universe, we experience our first real oneness with it that is not merely the product of a dream or some abstract thought. In this way, an intimate awareness can light up within us, which perhaps I can express by saying, quote, Earth, you are not alone in the cosmos. You are indeed one with the great cosmos, along with me, 
and all earthly beings. Close quote. Through this experience of oneness with the silicious rock, we no longer view the earth as separate from the rest of the universe, but as one etheric sphere formed from the universal etheric sphere. This is our first feeling. There are many ancient songs and ancient myths filled with wondrous revelations that sing to us across the ages in the literature from a time of inherent human clairvoyance. Today people read such songs and myths and like to feel that it lifts their hearts and souls. But the truth of such songs and myths eludes people of our time. We cannot even be affected by a true feeling for the Bhagavad Gita, for example, or some other Indian or Eastern literature, unless spiritual insight shows us the real possibility of our unity with the earth, leading to oneness with the whole cosmos. In many cases, the mood of those old songs and ballads arose from such oneness. It is like a walking in consciousness with light, a light that penetrates the hard quartz, making it a cosmic EYEI through which we can look out into the vast expanses of the universe. Indeed, we can say that when we begin from reality in our description of the suprasensory human being, we feel inherently disinclined to be abstract and theoretical. Rather, we are predisposed to present it in a way that links the feeling life of the human soul to the ideas we express. This should deeply stir our hearts whenever we study our suprasensory nature, that it is impossible to express our spiritual knowledge without uniting our thoughts and ideas with the whole human being in will and feeling. We must endure life, but one of the things most difficult to bear for those who are aware of the true human elements of suprasensory knowledge is to hear the way certain people turn spiritual understanding into fixed theories. Theoretical discussion of the spiritual world is no less painful than holding your finger in a flame. After we have progressed a certain degree in suprasensory cognition, when we understand through imagination the suprasensory forces that are active in us between birth and death, we can continue by attaining the level of suprasensory knowledge related to inspiration. Through inspiration, we can see into the nature of what we were before birth, when we descended into earthly life, and we can also see what we will become after passing through the gate of death. Everything described in these lectures can be seen. Our journey through the various regions in which our countenance is formed and where we metamorphose from the previous life into a new earthly life, through inspiration, we can view everything I have described as our journey through the various starry worlds. Inspiration, through which we look so deeply into our own inner being, assumes a particular nuance when we consider that what can be described as our experience in the life between death and rebirth also lives in us during our life here on earth. Indeed, all the grandeur and cosmic majesty that must be portrayed by describing the true human being as a denizen of the starry worlds, and indeed even the worlds of the higher hierarchies, is also alive in us as we stand here on the earth, seemingly insignificant creatures from the spatial perspective within the skin of our physical bodies. Inasmuch as our knowledge can penetrate what we contain as a physical heritage of our true being between death and a new birth, we can also do something more. We can penetrate to the depths of our planet Earth, to its veins of metal ores of lead, silver and copper, to everything that lives as the metallic elements of the rocky Earth. When observed with the ordinary senses, the metallic substances initially do little more than suggest the various kinds of earth in which they occur. But 
when we penetrate the earth with a spiritually honed perception that tells us about the human spirit, something special happens to the metallic elements within the earth. All the copper, silver and gold in the earth begin to speak in a rich and mysterious language. As we live on earth we are confronted by something that gives us a more intimate relationship with the living soul being of the earth itself. Metal ores tell us something. They become cosmic memories for us. This is actually what happens. Consider yourselves, for example, when you nurture an active inner stillness and allow old memories to bring many things into your soul, you feel as though you were living again in numerous past experiences. You reconnect with many who over the course of your life become dear and may have died long ago. You feel remote from the present and deeply involved with the joys and sorrows of previous experiences you have lived through. Something very similar, but on a much larger scale, happens when we unite with the veins of metal in the earth through the inner light of spiritual insight, of suprasensory cognition. This is different from the experience of quartz, in which we are transported in a kind of visual sense into the vast cosmic spaces. In this case we become one, in a certain sense, with the body of the earth. As you perceive inwardly the metallic veins in their wonderful speech, you feel united with the innermost soul and heartbeat of the earth itself, and you become aware of memories that are not your own. Memories echo inwardly. They are the earth's own memories of its earlier stages, before it was our earth, before the present animal and plant kingdoms began to dwell on it, and before the minerals that now exist in its depths. Along with the earth, one remembers those ancient days when the earth was united with the other planets in our solar system. One recalls ages when the earth had not yet separated, because it had not yet condensed and become firm within, as it is today. One recalls a time when the whole solar system was an ensouled living organism, and human beings lived within it in a very different form. Thus the metallic veins in the earth lead us to the earth's own memories. When we have this inner experience, we can understand very clearly why we are sent to the earth by the divine spiritual beings who guide the universal order. Living in the earth's memories like this causes us to gain a real sense of our own thinking for the first time. Because we have comprehended Earth's memories, we feel how our thinking is connected with the Earth itself. And the moment we make the Earth's memories our own, we are surrounded by the beings of the second hierarchy, Curiotites, Dunamis, and Exousiae. This is how, even in earthly life, we may be surrounded by the beings who surround us at a certain time between death and a new birth as described. We fully realize that we contact beings of the second hierarchy while we are incarnated on earth between birth and death. But these beings do no more than work with us between death and rebirth to transform our being. They also play a role in forming the cosmos as a whole. Here we see how the higher cosmic order gives these beings the responsibility for everything in the earth related to the influences of those veins of metal. Now, we can look back again. What I discussed before about the experience of quartz was probably not immediately understood, because it is not very obvious. But our marvelous experience of the earth's memories in relation to the veins of metal does speak plainly. Now, however, we can return and try to understand something that perhaps was not understood at first. Now we become aware that we are surrounded by beings of the third hierarchy, angels, archangels, and archai, as we soar into the great cosmic whole, 
borne by the light that permeates quartz. And we learn something very special. As we ascend into the high mountains or descend to veins of metal deep in the earth, the reality of it is not communicated to us by our ordinary senses. We become familiar with the marvel that in the high mountain regions of the silicious rock, angels, archangels and archai weave and hover over those rocky peaks. And when we descend into the earth, we find the beings of the second hierarchy permeate the paths of metallic veins. We can also say that during earthly life, we are among the spiritual beings connected with our innermost being between death and a new birth. When a certain time has elapsed after passing through the gate of death, we arrive consciously in the realms of angels, archangels, and archai. The condition of consciousness we have developed in this disembodied state enables us to perceive the beings around us just as we perceive the four kingdoms of the natural world during our life on earth. But when our higher level of consciousness there enables us to behold angels, archangels and archai, everything that the senses could perceive has disappeared because our senses have been surrendered to the elements with our bodies. Between death and a new birth we perceive nothing of the earthly sensory life. Then the angels, archangels and archai narrate for us the story of what they are doing down on earth. This is the appropriate way to say it, since it fits the situation exactly. They recount how they are occupied with more than the life they live with us. They whisper, quote, We also participate in cosmic creation. We are the creative beings of the cosmos. And we look down in earth existence upon the earthly forms shaped by the quartz rock and its relatives. Close quote. Then, while among these angels, archangels and archai, between death and a new birth, we realize that we must return to earth, because during this time we come to know the beings of the third hierarchy. We also hear them speak in a wonderful way of their works on earth. We realize that we can perceive their activities only by descending to earth, clothed in a physical human body, and thus partaking of sensory impressions. Indeed, the deepest secrets of sensory perception, not just those available in high mountain country, but everything that the senses convey, are revealed to us in the wonderful words of the beings we are associated with between death and rebirth. Ordinary consciousness just cannot perceive the real mystery and beauty of physical nature, which is so great that after passing through the gate of death, our earthly memories of it are truly illuminated when we hear the third hierarchy describe what we perceived with our e eyes, ears, and other senses on earth. Thus is the connection between what is physical and supraphysical. It is also the connection between physical human life and supraphysical life. The universe is full of splendor, and it is only proper that everything we see in physical existence delights and uplifts us. We come to know its actual mysteries once we have passed through the gate of death. The more we learn to rejoice in the physical world, the more deeply we enter into all the joy that the sense world bestows and the greater the measure of understanding that we bring to the realm of the angels. They are waiting to tell us of the mysteries here on earth that we cannot yet understand, but that we do understand once we pass into the supraphysical realm. And our relationship is similar in the case of the second hierarchy, Curiotites, Dunamis, and Exousiae, within whom we live for a certain period between death and rebirth. We develop a special relationship with them by penetrating the earth's memories along the path of light of its veins of metal. Here again, however, 
We can understand our earthly experiences of the metals only when we have crossed over into the region of the second hierarchy. You see, one of the most beautiful experiences we can have is to be able to investigate the various relationships between metals and human health. And I have reason to hope that the anthroposophic movement will be particularly successful in uncovering the beauty to be found in this area of research. Every metal and metal compound has a specific connection to human health. As we go through life and experience health and illness, we continually form ties to the metals and their compounds that give the earth its memories. We must go beyond merely theorizing about the healing properties of lead and copper and their compounds and so on. These substances all constitute significant and valuable remedies if we know how to prepare them correctly. We must not be satisfied with talking in abstractions about the wonderful relationships between metals and the human being. Indeed, a feeling of reverence arises in us even now as we contemplate metallic veins in the earth's depths. But we must go another step and develop a deep understanding of the marvelous connection between metals and the human being, a connection first revealed to us once we have examined it from the perspective of the human being in relation to health and illness. As I suggested, it is hoped that much can be communicated to human hearts and minds through the anthroposophic movement in connection with this knowledge, since it is extremely important. In the past it was not so important, because humankind had an inherent sense of all these relationships. They recognized that the lead process is related to this or that in the human head, and they knew the connections involved in the silver process. The ancients spoke often of such matters. People of more recent times may read about this but fail to understand a word of it, because it is approached from a modern scientific perspective as though it were merely vague and empty abstractions. Anthroposophic knowledge can deepen the mind and soul through contemplating the wonderful relationship between the metals and human health and illness. Thus when we die we can take with us into the spiritual world something to help us understand in a very special way the language of the second hierarchy. As a result of such preparation here on earth we will take with us the necessary understanding so that the most profound mysteries of the universe can be revealed to us. This is a fact. We learn what anthroposophy teaches us not merely out of curiosity, but for its results once we have passed through the gate of death. Spiritual science offers us exactly what we need to find the right relationship with the beings we encounter between death and rebirth. Because those beings make up the world that will then surround us, our whole being must find a connection with them. Thus, it is possible to present a detailed image of how we find such a relationship with those beings of the higher hierarchies between death and a new birth. But there is something else related to this as we pass through those regions for which we will be well prepared by our understanding of what has just been described. Now we must describe another experience. Nature will reveal her mysteries to us if we can understand the relationship between earth's metals and human health and illness. But there is something else involved in those secrets of nature. First we hear the beings of the second hierarchy speak of the nature of one or another metallic element, gold, silver, lead, copper, and so on. On earth we have a certain relationship to the great spiritual world when we first learn to read. And it dawns on us that by reading we can begin to penetrate many mysteries of the world which might otherwise remain beyond our knowledge. Of course, I am using this metaphor for comparison only, because as an earthly experience, there is really nothing special in this process. 
through the beings of the second hierarchy, at a certain point in our passage through the life after death. We familiarize ourselves with the language describing the metals and their connection with human health and illness. This language becomes what it should only when we can raise it from the level of prose in the spiritual cosmos to that of cosmic poetry, or, more accurately, when we are able to lift ourselves to cosmic poetry. Initially, we are largely a tabula rasa in relation to poetry. On earth we can come to understand the voice, the rhythm, and the whole artistic form of verse. Unless we lack all feeling for poetry, likewise when we ascend from dry prose to the poetry of the world beyond the threshold, we rise from speech of the second hierarchy, telling us of the relationship between the metals and human health, to an understanding of the mysteries of cosmic moral existence. This moral life encompasses not only human souls, but also the divine souls of all the hierarchical beings. And the mysteries of the soul element are opened to us, especially in this region. Then we can take another step. We can experience what I described as going up into the mountains and into the earth's depths. Everything remains still at first. We observe the quiet veins of metal and the stone along the mountain ridges. But we can go farther and try not to view things only with a dry utilitarian perspective, though we should not underrate that kind of observation, since we need to plant both feet firmly on the ground if we want to enter the suprasensory world, healthy in body and spirit. We can try to not stop short at what is thus far revealed to us, but instead continue by observing metals melting in a fiercely hot fire and how they change from a solid to a liquid. By visiting a foundry, for example, we see iron in the furnaces as it is made to flow radiantly, or witness the processes in which metal ores such as antimony are transformed not only from solid to liquid but gradually into other states. As the metals are subjected to fire, we can allow what happens to them to affect us, and thus something quite new and different impresses the spiritual insight we have nurtured, and we develop a tremendously profound impression of the mysteries of our own existence. I have often referred to this by saying that we should consider human beings in comparison to animals. The various kinds of anatomical comparisons made today human and animal bones, muscles, and even blood, do reveal certain affinities. But human superiority to animals becomes evident only when we consider the fact that the spines of animals are, for the most part, parallel with the earth's surface, whereas that of the human being is vertical. Or, consider our marvelous possession of language, with which the animals are not gifted, and go on from there to our capacity to think which is developed from speech. When we observe how speaking and thinking develop in children and how their whole orientation in life begins with attaining an upright posture, we witness the activity of the marvelous forces whereby children find their way dynamically into the world. We see how the orientation of a child's limbs expresses itself in the melody and articulation of speech. If we observe how we actually build and shape ourselves in the world of the senses, we see formative forces quietly at work. It is indeed wonderful to see a child's growth as months pass, seeing the progress from crawling to upright walking and the adjustment of the whole orientation of the child's body and limbs to the world's dynamics, and then the formation of speech and thinking from the physical being. With the mind at rest, we can contemplate this in all its wonder, watching the quiet majesty with which it presents itself to the observer, 
We observe a child learning to walk and talk and think, and it seems to be the most beautiful thing one can witness in human life. We gather impressions of this beautiful element in human life, and then, on the other hand, we can also witness the melting of metals when exposed to fire. We perceive the spiritual archetype of this in children, which leads them to learn to walk and speak. The archetype of this power is revealed when flames take hold of the metal, making it flow. As the metal becomes more fluid, it becomes more volatile, and we have a clearer perception of the inner resemblance between that process, which is, in fact, metal's destiny, and the smelting and volatilizing process in cosmic fires that enable a little child to walk, speak, and think. And we realize that the beings of the first hierarchy, the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones, are involved in a twofold activity. One aspect of this is that they speak to us from the spiritual world into which we pass midway through our life between death and a new birth, where they reveal the mysteries of planetary and other cosmic activities, as I have described during the last few days. They also work down into the visible world. Here in the visible realm, the influences of the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones are active, on the one hand, in little children as they learn to walk, speak, and think, and on the other hand, in everything behind the earth's process in which fire plays a role, such as when fire melts glowing metals. Our planet earth is indeed built up through the melting and glowing of metals in the forces of fire. As we look back to ancient times, when this planet Earth was being built, we see in the metal melting through the forces of fire an aspect of the works of the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones in the earthly world. In particular, how the beings of the first hierarchy accomplish this work, supported primarily by the thrones. We can look back into the ancient times of Earth and see how metals glowed and liquefied as they were subjected to the forces of fire and how they played a special role in the earth's manifestation. The thrones had an especially active role in this, with the seraphim and cherubim quietly working alongside. It is the cherubim, however, who play the main role when children learn to walk, talk, and think. But it is always the beings of the first hierarchy that we see working harmoniously in both of these activities, this kind of knowledge links earthly death with resurrection in our life beyond the threshold. Such knowledge reveals the kinship between the cosmic fires by which metals are melted and the powers that make us truly human. Thus the whole world becomes one and we realize that our earthly life between birth and death is really no different than our life in the spiritual world beyond the threshold. Life between death and a new birth is a metamorphosis of earthly life. We know how one becomes the other, and thus how one is merely a different form of the other. When such insights lift our souls, more are added along with them. Indeed, these other insights can also come in another way. Try to imagine what I have been describing today as the wonderful relationship between the way fire forces melt and vaporize metals and the process of children learning to walk and speak and think. If you meditate on this in such a way that it deepens you inwardly, a force will take hold of your soul that allows you to solve a great mystery of life, so that the soul is developed and enriched. I am speaking of the functioning of karma or destiny in the human being we can come to a real understanding of human destiny and karma through the twofold experience of seeing a child learning to walk, talk, and think on the one hand, and the melting and vaporizing of metals subjected to fire on the other. Karma is revealed in the fiery smelting of metals and in the appropriate transformation of a child's animal nature into human nature when learning to walk, talk, and think. Karma 
is the suprasensory element that reaches into our immediate active human life. As we progress in our meditation, we come to understand the mysteries of destiny that weave through our life. On the one hand, we have a picture of the destiny of metals as they are subjected to fire, and on the other, the destiny of the primal human being descended to earth and learning to walk, talk, and think. Between these images we find what we need to know of the mystery of karma for our human life. So you see, the suprasensory human being speaks into the human world of the senses about the matter of human destiny. This is what I wanted to speak to you about as part of our study of a suprasensory human being. We could never base such a study on abstract theories. To understand the human being, we must reach into all the mysteries involved in the being of nature as well as in the spirit of the cosmos. Ultimately, human beings are intimately connected with all the mysteries of nature and universal spirit. The human being is in fact a universe in miniature. But we must not imagine that whatever happens on a grand scale out in the macrocosm occurs in the same way in the microcosm. As the metals melt, majestic flames of the fire's forces flow out to the very limits of macrocosmic space, and such boundaries do exist. My dear friends, try to picture these fiery forces through which metals become fluid and volatile. This vaporized substance radiates into the vast expanses of the universe, but it returns in the forces of light and its warmth. And as it returns from cosmic space, it takes hold of a child who can only crawl and helps that child to stand upright and walk. So we see the upward flow of currents in melting metals. They turn around when they have gone far enough out into the cosmos and return as the forces that lift a child into uprightness. What we see on the one hand we find also on the other. This gives you a picture of the ascending and descending cosmic forces of metamorphosis and transformation that work in the spirit of the cosmos. Now, you will also be able to understand the true meaning of something else related to the knowledge of ancient times, the old practice of sacrifice. People sent their sacrificial flame, along with what they burned within it, out into vast cosmic space to the gods, so that it might return to work in the human world. The attitude of the priestly sage toward the sacrificial fire may be expressed in these words, quote, O flame, I commit to you what is mine on earth. As the smoke ascends, may the gods accept it. May what is borne upward by flame become divine blessing, poured again upon the earth as creative fructifying power. Close quote. As we hear the words of those ancient sacrificial priests who spoke of suprasensory worlds, we realize that they too were speaking of the cosmic mysteries of which we are a part. My dear friends, this is what I wanted to say to you about our suprasensory nature as human beings, as it is understood by spiritual science.